you know, start pretty promptly. Um, some people might not have too much time and we should just dive right in. Um, I would just like to say, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today on our first installment of the Artist Talk series that we just um, really began this month. And we're happy to um, have Marcy Rosenblatt as our first artist to talk about her work, share her ideas and kind of invite us into her studio virtually via Zoom. Um, I would recommend that everybody keep themselves muted we would like to invite questions and comments throughout the talk. Um, the easiest way to do this is to type Q for question or C for comment into the um, comment field. Amanda, who's gonna be the mastermind of our Zoom talk here and keep check on questions will then um, let us know and invite people um, to comment or question throughout. We're trying to make this as engaged as possible. This is not a lecture, um, it's a conversation. You can hear me talk. But... And um, we would like to start a little bit by looking at a slideshow that we prepared of Marcy's work. And Amanda, maybe you can start rolling it. Will do. Mm -hmm. And then we dive into some questions. You can't hear Marcy talking. I can't hear anything now. I don't know There's what- something wrong there. Okay. That's the chat. Yeah, tell them. We're starting uh, by looking at some works on paper. These are all from 2020, or primarily from 2020. And we came to Marcy really in the course of this past year because we were looking for artists who were working on a cohesive body of work during this very difficult time. And uh, we met her through our drawing challenge on? and then started a conversation. What do you mean? Now we're working <laughs> ourselves through the canvases. These are paintings. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, now. Okay. <laughs> Marcy, most importantly, can you hear me? Um, let me interrupt. So Jeff, hi yeah. Jeff. I'm, I haven't been speaking. That's why you can't hear me. Okay. <laughs> and as long as you can hear Stephanie, you're fine. And you guys should probably mute. Everyone should mute yeah, until that's what the I end think. because it picks up. Yeah. Uh, we pick up noise. Thanks. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming. Hey, Marcy. Hey. Hi. I have one problem. My screen is showing the uh, captions, but the images themselves are sort of cropped, they're towards the top. Is there something in my uh, viewing window that is making that happen? Um, is anyone else having that issue with the cropping? Do you see on top a little bracket that says view options? Yes. If you click on that, it will give you the option to decrease the window. Maybe it's I because see. of your screen okay. size, but I you can customize it. Okay, because I had made it to fit the window. Yeah. And, yeah, make it a little smaller and then you should be fine. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry to interrupt. No, please. We want you to see the images. So Marcy, maybe we just start by talking um, about this body of work. You titled it Shadow Liners. Maybe you could begin by telling us how you came to this title. What makes this body of work so particular? your technique and the materials used? The, the work is different um, in many ways. One is my process changed considerably. Um, uh, after COVID started, um, it felt uh, funny for me to do a very large painting. So I started doing small works on paper. So the pieces on paper, are around 12 by 13. Um, and I, my feeling was if I continued to do work that size, that would be fine with me. But after about, about 25 of them or so, I just had the need to uh, do these larger. And, um, and I, I've never had this happen before, but I literally wanted to do the specific work larger. So I, um, actually this is, kind of telling or I don't know if it's fair, but uh, I employed my daughter-in-law and my niece to choose from my work which painting to paint. 
So I, in the, I was trying to get rid of all of my confliction and anxiety during a time that was just filled with that kind of angst. And so they chose the first one, which is actually, Stephanie, the one that you were drawn to. So you can, you can thank them for that. <laughs> so you. my process has been, I work directly from the work on paper. They change a lot as I make them larger, but the other piece of it that works for me and is enjoyable is you know, my background was working from observation. So the point at which I'm working from the work on paper, I feel as if I'm going back to that and then it switches again to abstraction. So there's a nice back and forth in the process. Maybe we can even go back a little further since um, lace is such a particular component of these works. How did you start working with that? How did you find lace as a, a material to use in your, in your work, in the works on paper and in the painting? Um, it actually started, um, in a way it started after 9-11 because I had been just, do I had been doing abstract paintings um, I painted figuratively for 15 years, but then became abstract um, right before my son was born. And so I'd been painting abstractly for quite a while. And after 9-11, it was another crisis sort of moment where um, I doubted painting and I decided collage might be a better way to go. So at that point, I was, I was actually I was collaging images onto painting and I can even recall at one point I had a painting and I, I actually put a veil over it. So I was really, I had the material right there and I was using it. And I, then I started to collect things that I would find because once you start collaging, there's unlimited possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, but that didn't, I actually don't like unlimited possibilities. I, I'm rather reductive. So I, I went, I thought I just want to do this through paint. And um, the last thing that happened was I, I pressed a paper towel into some paint and by ex quite by accident, I saw print and I fell in love. And I, I, I thought, that um, it, it did what I always had been doing in my paintings, but it did it more directly. So all of my abstract work has a certain amount of veiling or something hidden. Um, there's even my figurative work had a narrative where there, there was a little voyeuristic quality to um, the figures. And so this covered the painting and it, it also revealed the color underneath. And that's how it started. Um, I moved to lace because I wanted a larger pattern. Um, it was a formal decision. It was not it was, about the allusion to uh, a female practice or homemaking or domesticity. Well, I'd, I was already there, so to speak, because the change also happened when I moved my, we moved our Williamsburg studios to home. So it was the first time in a long time, um, probably since the eighties that I was painting in my own house. And I, you know, was grabbing things to, once I found that the paper towel made a print, I grabbed a blanket, I grabbed a curtain. I, I really embraced the fact that I was working at home and these things were available to me in my home. So before the lace, before I actually went out and tried to find lace, I was already connected to the fact that, um, that this body of work was directly connected to the fact that I was living and working in the same place. And, and that's what I was bringing to this work. Um, so I, I was there, although when I, Decided to use lace, it, it was not an easy decision because of, um, I don't know, it took courage for me. I, I don't think I could have used lace um, when I was in my 20s. I, I felt that I had to prove um, that I was closer to an abstract expressionist than 
um, you know, a woman. So I, I, I thought about away from the domestic connotation in a way. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, the um, pattern and decoration movement, when that was going on, I was in Kansas City studying, you know, a very formal education, um, looking at Cezanne and Matisse um, and Rembrandt. And mm -hmm. I was totally unaware of what was going on in California. And um, we, we were kept, as Alan said, who was on earlier, we were in Kansas City and whatever your department was doing, that's what you were doing. And um, I was unaware. I, I often thought I want, you know, it makes you question what art school does because who knows what would have happened had I gone to school out west. But um, that was my, my introduction to. And when did this awareness change? When you said you had a very formal education out there, you later went to Vermont. When did your horizon yeah, open to other forms of expression? I, th I think that um, it changed through the, the development of my painting. So from working figuratively and uh, sort of conservative, I went on to do invented figures that were allegorical. And although I wasn't thinking directly feminist thoughts, um, these paintings were often images of uh, monumental women and their skirts became parachutes. They would, they, some of them, they would jump off of buildings and their skirts would save them. So I, I came about all of this kind of through the back door and just in a personal expression. And then I realized one day what I was doing. Like I, in the studio, I'm always thinking, that's an interesting shape. I'm, I'm, I'm very rarely thinking about the concept at that moment. And it isn't until I can stand back and really observe what I've done that I realize. And, and so that was moving towards it as well. And the other thing that, and after that, they all became sort of veiled. And I realized that there was something very interesting to me about um, revealing something slowly. I feel like it's, pretty human. I think that when we meet each other, you don't know everything all at one time. And I, I like that to happen in my work as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about your shapes? How premeditated are they? Or in, uh, how intuitive? They're totally intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, I tried. <laughs> They're totally intuitive. I And, and the... Um, What's so nice is before I started doing the work on paper, I was painting uh, large canvases and I would have to, f I figured out all of that on the canvas. So it was kind of strenuous. And I don't know that I really got the most interesting shape I could because it would be exhausting. And what I realized is it's, for me, it's been a real breakthrough that I have something in front of me that I can see the whole thing at one time and I can do anything I want and push any direction I want. Um, and I, okay, so I don't think about it initially, but once I get a form, for instance, in this painting, I, I might have spent, I may have done the space between those two shapes, changed that many, many times till I got it right. So I can take like a, a very small area. Mm -hmm. Once the whole thing's out there and it's intuitive, then I sort of look at it and I want to make sure it's really saying what I want it to say. And often that at times it has to do with the relationship with the shapes. You use the word narrative um, a little bit earlier. Are you referring to having kind of a narrative storyline in your mind when you are creating shapes? Because we're not looking at figurative work. No, say. no. Even though there's allusions to the figure or some shapes have a kind of a, um, yeah, like a figurative gestalt. You know, at times there might be a torso or there might be a shoulder, but it's abstracted nevertheless. 
Yes. Do you mean by narrative? And by choice, I'm abstract. You know, I want them to be abstract. Mm -hmm. um, I think the narrative, it really comes from the lace over it. You know, um, not exactly knowing how this uh, painting, um, how it happened. The, there's mystery to it. Um, and, I, and I think it's not really a narrative as much as, you know, if one of my, if I feel one of my larger paintings is successful, it's because there's a certain amount of content. And mm -hmm. I do think the figure comes up, but that's, it, it's intuitive and I'm not doing it intentionally. I think that uh, there are some abstract painters that would take that away because they're so pure, but I enjoy it. And then I might tweak it even. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. <laughs> You're veiling it, but that's the theme, right? <laughs> Maybe um, just for now that we have a nicely sized group here, um, to talk about what step comes first, that the lace is not the, the first and not quite the last. Right? Maybe you can just explain the, the process a little bit because it's so particular to this body of work. Yeah, um, well, actually, the first thing that happens is I make my own paint which is also really important uh, to this work because um, I'm mixing um, pigment with a, a very matte silica medium. And so the surface of the painting is not like oil paint or like acrylic. And, and I realized in getting ready for the talk and thinking about the people that I love that, you know, there's always been this uh, Piero della Francesca and, you know, um, frescoes, frescoes. And I, I realized that that's what's happening with the paint. So that's the first step. Um, and as I'm working now, I, I have something I'm working from, but when I'm working um, with the work on paper, I'm just, in, I'm just putting down a shape, any shape. Um, I did kind of conscious, well, I'm not sure. My color changes. It's intuitive. Um, and I, I occasionally make a conscious choice. Um, I'd never put black in paintings and I had started to admire it. And it, it wasn't coming natural at all. Like if I would go into my studio and let myself just work purely intuitively, black would not come out. So there was a time when I sat down and I I just started with black to see how I would then respond and respond after that. After I get the forms, um, which I'm, well, it's first changing, you know, I, they change a million times and sometimes I think they're finished and I look at them later and they're not and I work back into them. But once I get it, there's a little difficult part because the beginning it's chaotic, then it gets very precise. Um, the edges are really clean. I spend a long time, you know, kind of making this perfect, to me, perfect edge and form. And then I don't know what's gonna happen I, when I spray paint through lace over it. And I always know that's gonna happen. And at that moment, I, mm, I'd say there's a, 40% chance, 50% chance that the whole painting's ruined. That's and then incredible. you start over again. What? That's, very, that's incredible. So that's a very nerve wracking stage. Yeah. So far, <laughs> and then 50% you might just ruin it completely. And when that happens, do you bring a painting to a similar place and then start with the lace part one more time? Yeah. Or do you just abandon the whole composition? Sometimes I abandon, if it happens too much, I abandon the whole composition. Mm -hmm. But now I'll just keep going and I'll, I'll do it again. I, I'll just make it again and try again. Because that color, you know, I, you can't try it out, really. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I don't know how that color, I mean, I'm trying to know, um, but it, it's really difficult. So. I lie lace over it and I actually can't see my painting at that point. So there's also a point in the painting where 
you know, it could take me a couple of hours to get the lace on right, because I also think about the orientation of it. You know, I might, like this one, this piece of lace is vertical. And, oh, it's not in here. There's another one with the same piece of lace, but it's at a diagonal. Um, and then sometimes I want the edge of the lace to show. Mm -hmm. And all those decisions make a difference. Um, also, the kind of lace makes a difference. So now I might, I'm really thinking about it a lot. And I know more. So I know if there's big shapes, what might happen, but I can never be sure. And that's painting blind at that point. Like the, the painting's covered, I can't see what's underneath. I make my own spray paint um, and uh, I spray and then I pick it up and it, it's either a disaster or magic. That's sort of, you know, um, there's not a lot of in between for me with, with that part, just that portion. Seems to me that there's a lot of ritual involved in the making of these works. And maybe it kind of relates to what you said earlier. You don't like open-ended decisions in a way that sounds like you established your own uh, set of rules or your own skeleton of, of working. And um, can you talk a little bit about how important that is to have a certain structure for you personally as, as an artist? I think it's enormously important. It's, it's why, um, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I couldn't, I didn't continue with collage. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I love paint because you're starting out with absolutely nothing. Um, it's very limited, really. You know, I just, um, I, and I can easily um, work on a body, how can I explain this? Um, the way uh, a series works is I have the limitation of what I'm doing and I love within that all the different uh, variables that can happen. So um, I, I'm always feeling there's unlimited um, uh, possibilities. And so it's really important for me to stay sane that I um, keep things simple. And um, I usually, I almost always have something um, that is a structure that I need to adhere to. Like there was a time I used brushes and there was a time when I just did anything I wanted. And then I just got sick of, I don't know. I, I got tired of it. I didn't want to see, I didn't want to see what I had in mind. That's another part of it is I, I like to get something from the painting itself. So if, if it has a certain set of rules, then it's, it's kind of not all up to me, which brings us back to the lace. Um, there's, there's chance. So there's sort of control and then there's chance. And I, I like that um, there's that opportunity that I'm not making the decision at that point. Do you see a relation um, between your work, this body of work and photography? Yes. Yeah, I do. Can you talk about that and the first conscious contemplation or do you see yourself in dialogue with maybe a particular, uh, um, artist movement or genre? Well, I mean, I think in terms of photography, I can't think of a photographer offhand, but I, I love photography. I mean, I, I, I actually um, learned a lot from my own, my, I take pictures. So I'm not at all a professional photographer and I do what everybody else does with my iPhone, but when I, when I got an iPhone, I started um, photographing uh, tarps and construction netting um, and any kind of construction site because I was so, I just loved the way things looked draped. And through that, I found, you know, I was, it was sort of reinforcing what I was doing at the time. 
Um, that was the beginning of the change. But also what comes to mind is Ross Blechner's paintings, um, his early paintings uh, when he was addressing AIDS and then the dome paintings are very photographic mm -hmm. um, and illusionistic uh, and full of light. And those things are important to me too. But when I look at painting, I mean, I, I really like Marsha Hafif and Carrie Moyer um, mm -hmm. as a young artist named Alice Tippett, who's not photographic at all, but implies the figure um, and Gary Steffen uh, because he kind of, he has an implied sort of an almost an implied narrative you you feel that there's an object there um, Amanda maybe we can look at um, the work called in disguise the latest uh, work that Marcy shared with us and Marcy maybe we can talk about this uh, in particular might be nice to discuss one example It's a painting that you just shared with us in this past week. Right, I just completed finished it recently. <laughs> which is just a fantastic piece, I think. Thank you. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about this, maybe starting first with something as obvious as color. <laughs> How did you bring these colors about? You know, not easily. I don't know what to say. This was one, I have a small one of it, and I mean, that I worked from and- You mean um, a work on paper? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And I, I did it larger and um, didn't like it at all. Uh, and sort of, I'd, some, some of the people that I talked to did, so they suggested I just turn it around and forget about it. <laughs> um, which is, so I wouldn't ruin it. They liked it, but I, I didn't forget about it and I worked back into it. Um, and I just kept mixing till it felt right. I mean, if I'm working directly, that's what's going on. So what I kept from the original painting, which was also in the work on paper, was the right side where you see the more triangular or square pattern. And mm -hmm. I left that and then I redid all the rest. Um, and I, it took, like I had that shape, that um, black shape, but I kept moving it. Like I would move it a little bit to the left and then I would fill it out a little bit. I would move it higher. Um, and it never, it didn't seem right for a very long time. And I had the gray. And then at the end, I had that pink, which it was different. It was placed differently, but I kept changing them. And then I thought, well, maybe if the background is darker, it will work. The last thing I did was I took the gray and I, I worked the gray inside the big black shape and a, and a lighter gray on the other gray shape. And I just thought, okay, that's it. And I sprayed it. And when I took the lace off of it, I realized I'd made a masked painting. So, you know, it just, uh, I don't know, it's both reassuring and kind of, uh, you know, maybe all ha I think it happens to artists all the time that what's going on in your life comes out in your work and, you, you know, is it, is the, I guess this would be my question, like, is the painting really better now or does it just relate to what's going on? Um, but I was pretty excited that that happened. Um, and yeah, I, I, I feel good about this painting. It feels a little darker than the other ones. Um, you know, yeah, I, I I, I think it's a wonderful example of how your work at times can look more figurative. Um, yes. You know, and of course it's in our minds and, you know, because as you say, the times we're going through, we see a mass figure. It's interesting to contemplate how we would have looked at this painting um, 12 months ago and if it would have been created in just this fashion since it was not premeditated. Um, it's oh, quite fascinating. Right. I think you're right. I don't, I, I don't think it would have occurred to us, but I, I'm not sure. That's, that's a really great thought. 
Um, it will be interesting to see how you look at this painting in, in 10, 15 years. Yeah. You know, as yeah. a time capsule. I, I, I do, re you know, there's something about abstraction that doesn't, well, most abstraction doesn't seem to situate itself in time, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's exciting if it does. And, and, you know, if this does that, then I would be happy. I would like um, to take the opportunity to invite um, everyone and anyone to make comments or ask questions. You can either uh, let us know in the chat um, by saying Q for question or C for comment, or if you uh, would rather just have us read out a question, we're happy to do that as well. I think earlier there was a question about um, the type of lace. And you address that a little bit, but maybe you can talk about where you find it. Some of these pieces, as you mentioned, are historic pieces. Are you searching in particular places or for particular kinds of lace, um, culturally, uh, for example? You or know, the pattern is it really just about the pattern? It's more about the pattern, although I love that there's other references now, you know what I mean, like culturally. And I, I like that it, it crosses over into other cultures, but I'm really looking at it in, in a formal way where, you know, I know that I, sometimes a painting needs to have a really big shape and then very fine shapes, or I want it to be fine all the way through. So um, I'm always looking and, and you, I can only use them for a certain amount of time. And I, I get them often at thrift stores. Um, there was no tradition in my family, so none of it's from my grandmother. Although uh, people have sent me lace. A friend just sent me a whole box um, because she had moved into her childhood home. And so um, sometimes, sometimes it comes in the form of a gift. How many times can you use the pieces you have? I mean, do they themselves become a part of a vocabulary? Do they reappear in, in several paintings, for example? Yes, they do. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, this one is a lace I was using in my previous body of work when I used, um, I was using commercial spray paint. And when I used commercial spray paint, they, they got very brittle and you know, maybe you could use it 10 times or, and it would be too brittle to use. And I actually revived it somehow. I'm getting a little desperate because <laughs> I haven't been out, you know, I haven't gone to a thrift store or, mm -hmm. you know, had the opportunity to get more. Um, and so I, I, I just thought I saved them. I, and you have to save them carefully. I mean, there's a whole, there, it's a very, it is very ritualistic. Like I can't fold them because they'll break, so they have to be hung. And um, anyway, it worked. So uh, this one's recycled from older. Now, that be because I'm doing making my own spray paint, they'll last longer, but I'm not sure how long. I have a question. Yes. May I ask a question? Yes, yes. please go ahead. Okay, so I heard what you were saying about the, you know, the. The use, the use of the veils uh, you're, as a, like an element to uh, represent hiding or like translucency or opacity. But uh, are you, do you see the use of the veil in your paintings as a, a direct metaphor more or more of an actual uh, hiding element within the pictorial space? In other words, is it metaphor or more or is it more actual hiding mechanism in, in your painting? Oh, I think it's both. That's a good question, but I feel like what it does is it ties my process to what the painting looks like. So, because I'm the maker and I know how they're made, I know I actually do cover the painting up. Um, but, and I know that I like people to look through the paintings. Um, one of the joys of seeing them having people see them in person is that they always go up close 
and they're they're kind of confused and and I like that. So I don't know if it's as much hiding as it is uh, confusing the space and more of a questioning and mystery. Okay, I think you answered well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Can I ask a question. Hi, Marcy. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wondered, it's like, um, when I look at your paintings, the first thing that always strikes me, you know, they're, one, they're beautiful and wonderful, but the sensuality, like to me, they're very sensual. And I feel like, yes, we talk about formalism and all these kind of things, but how do, do you feel that way about them too? Or is that something too personal or? No, I, I think I see that. And there's a couple things that can happen in my paintings. I think that sometimes they look sensual and I welcome that. Uh, it's a human um, experience that I, 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 I'm, I'd love for that to come through in my paintings for somebody. Um, and then one time I had a studio visit and someone said, there's something creepy about your paintings. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's great. You know, so anything that I don't know, any, anything that one would feel, if I can provoke a feeling, I'm happy. Although not intentionally, I'm not, you know, intent, it, it, it's true while I'm painting, I'm, I'm not consciously there. I, I really do let myself go. And so I, I, I do see these things only after the fact. No, I think that's what makes them so special that the sensuality is not forced, they're just there. And I know long, how long I've been working with this and it's, it's just incredibly beautiful. And, you know, so thank you. The other thing about that is that um, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the fact that it, if it's sex, sensuality, it seems to be female. And so I, I find that an interesting thing to explore. Like, is there, I think people put those two things together. And so, I, I like the idea that, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how many, if, if that's possible, is there a male painting? Is there a female painting? Does it matter? Uh, what are we used to seeing? I mean, there's, I'm, I'm curious. So it keeps me going. Marcy, this is Elizabeth. Hi. In response to what you're saying, is, are you spraying the entire canvas and then editing parts out with the, with the opaque color? Sometimes, yes. And when you do that, do you feel like maybe you're smothering the body? And that could be the male part? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I have like three men in my life. Well, two men and a baby that are all male. And I don't feel like I'm smothering the male part. Okay, that was really, sorry, that was really <laughs> essential. <laughs> that was great. But I mean, do you feel, but is there a kind of violence in that or a kind of, uh, you, know, you know? No, okay. Yes, yes. I think, I don't know if it's violence, but I, you know, there's times when I'm teaching and I'm watching my students struggle and I kind of have this little spiel where I'm like, what did you think it was going to feel like? You have to be willing it, you, to die. Like, you guys just let it go. And so I do have this um, feeling that you have to be able to abandon and wreck it in, in order to get further. And I really have a very extreme situation now where, as I said before, when I put the lace down, I, I could ruin it. So I am kind of uh, allowing that to happen, which I guess you could read as a violent act. Um, but it's just, for me, it's more of a scary act, like jumping off of a high dive. Thank you. And decisive, too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Marcy, to follow along on that, um, the act of veiling your painting and then what you're talking about seemed to me very married you know, the medium and the process are very much about what you're talking about. Did you come up with that intentionally? Wait, say it again. I, I'm not sure I understand. Ask me that question again. So, okay, so the, the process of making your work is very much about what your work is talking about. Yes. The way you're actually, when you cover the painting, 
and you're exploring not seeing it. Yes. You, ve you veiled the painting from yourself. Yes. And, now, and hence it's veiled somewhat to the viewer. Exactly. So, yeah, I am very conscious of that. And I, 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 I'm, I, yeah, I, I think it's uh, integral to the work is that my, you're getting my process. They, they don't seem like your traditional process paintings, like a Pollock would be a process painting. But in fact, um, you're, very, you're very much getting the process. And I, I like that that's shared when people get it. Sometimes they don't, but yes. Thank you. Marcy, that was one question earlier. Um, someone would like to know what silica medium is. Maybe we can clarify that. Silica medium is an uh, acrylic medium that uh, um, is, will dry matte. And it's, it's actually even called self-leveling. So for someone who doesn't want to have the sense of touch, it's sort of this perfect medium. And I, if, if, I don't know if, you, if someone's interested in buying it, I go to a store on the Lower East Side called Guerra Paint, and, and they sell pigments and mediums, and you can get all different kinds. Thank you. Marcy, oh, can you talk about the colors, how you choose it? I think that's where I see the sensuality a lot in the colors also that you've chosen. Well, usually, I mean, like it's, it's, it's very intuitive and one color feeds off the other, you know, the next, like that, that background of this one or this one changed many times too. So in, in, in fact, it got a little cooler in the back as, as it was developing. So the colors change. Occasionally, I, I just fall in love with a color and I, I have to put it in a painting. Um, actually, there's a pink work on paper um, that we might scroll through again. I, I think it's one of the ones that's double. Not that one. That. Here, it's... A, Yes, this is on the right. I saw pink like that. <laughs> I thought that is an amazing color. You know, like it's, it's not, it, it looks kind of blue, but it looks kind of red. And, and then I went back to the studio and I, I really wanted that color. Sometimes it works for me. Um, sometimes I'll see, I saw Vermeer at the Frick that had a specific yellow. And I came back to my studio and and actually ruined quite a few paintings trying to use it in my work. But um, yeah, usually it's intuitive and they did, they change depending on what's going on in the world, I think, in some ways. Do you keep a notebook, Marcy, where you take notes on colors and maybe try to uh, preserve a color that you might want to use later on? No, <laughs> I don't. Or shape? But you know what I, I, I sort of, in that regard, I really believe in uh, intuition. I, I actually, that painting that we were talking about with the mask, mm -hmm. there, there was another point where I was so frustrated and it was late at night. So I sat on Photoshop and I changed the background as many times as I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. I could just duplicate change, duplicate change. And then when I was all finished, I looked at what I did and about six times I picked the same color. And I thought that's the color. So for this painting. Um, so I think that you, I think I can count on my color memory somehow. So I don't do it. Um, and I'm always looking to be slightly different anyway. Are there any further questions? Oh, hi, Marcy. It's Gordon. Hi. Hi. Do you use that silicon flat, silica flat for the spray also? I do. You know? I do. I'm using the same. I get these, you know, that happened because I was traveling and I couldn't bring my commercial spray paint with me. And I 
developed, you know, I, I just ordered these little spray bottles like you would use to hold any kind of liquid. And then I, I mix a very watery mixture of the same paint I always use. And I do put some of the medium in it. It needs binder because I'm using pigment, so I have to. Yeah, Gara paint is really a great answer for acrylics. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. I'm still, uh, Marcy, I'm still trying to pinpoint what it is exactly about this series that has shifted um, outside of the use of black. I mean, I think the colors are, are sort of newly exquisite here. And um, it's almost as if you've managed to bring all your goodies together in a strange mm -hmm. way. You know, and, and, and they are more muted, definitely. And do you think that's, I mean, you've used black before, but you, it was more that you had black paintings rather than you incorporated the black in this way. Yeah, I had a couple oh. black paintings, yeah. but I never incorporated yeah. the black. Well, black I pushed on myself. Yeah, um, I know you said that. So what, I, they yeah. are different because I yeah. feel like since I think doing these small pieces has totally allowed me to come up with uh, a, a variety of shapes that I wouldn't have come up with any other way. And so I, I'm really able to do um, something that probably comes from years of uh, observation and anything I've ever painted and and I'm using my hand again so since I previously I wasn't using my hand I I've, I've also had periods in which I just poured the paint and recognized what it was doing and even moved the canvas in order to get the paint to to make a shape so yeah. I am using my hand when I do the small ones and, and um, I feel like that's the major change. I feel like both in the sort of slight figurative um, suggestions and in your handwork, you do both in a way that, you know, makes more sense than beforehand, you know, that, that, that has a, a, a rightness that that sort of came together this time. I don't know if it's just from experience or because the color makes more sense with the whole thing. But it's interesting to sort of bring something back, but then do it differently or know how to, you know, use it. Um, yeah. Marcy, there's the question about the passage of time, whether that's a part of um, your contemplation or how it feeds into your process or your work? Mm. I, I'm not sure. I mean, it, I can think of time in terms of um, the way one looks at a painting, but I, I'm not sure. Is that the question? I mean, I, I, I don't want these to be fast. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I can read you the question, okay. or maybe uh, it's coming from Cheryl. Maybe you can uh, uh, explain further what uh, you had in mind, if you're comfortable, Cheryl. She's still here. Maybe not. Maybe the passage of time and in and, and terms of the different stages you go through in your process. Well, that's interesting because the metaphor I, I I'm uh, my impression is that it probably goes in that direction oh she's saying she does not have a mic so she can <laughs> she can <laughs> <cannot laughs> clarify sorry but maybe Cheryl you'll type a little bit more yeah that's, <laughs> I will misrepresent your question it seems like a great question yeah it does so it seems like there's something about the open-ended process of the way you paint as you know it incorporates surprises and inquiry and uh, improvisation and I think in a way that's what allows the layers to sh take shape over time in a way that it would never happen that way uh, all at once even though it feels instantaneous 
it becomes kind of layered and filmic. And in order to do that, it seems necessary that the paintings are not predetermined. You know, they sort of take shape like uh, entities, open-ended or filmic, or just kind of like, um, there's something about potential trains of thought or like lyrical contemplation or something is all part of this work. Like it, it's, it's work to look at and it's beautiful, but it also is like confrontational and uh, sort of requires a kind of honesty. It's almost like there, that there's something of the dialogue that, that you have with the work as a painter that also engages viewers. Thank Maybe you. not in the exact same way as you, but it's, a, it, it's really great to see them. Thank you. Cheryl clarified her question a little bit further, so maybe we can just harken back to that. Um, she says that the forms feel like they're moving in space and that the layering itself takes time, the drawing of the layers before it can move on. Um, so again, the, the passage of time in that respect um, and whether that is part of the work. You know, so that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing I think that feels um, sort of not true or something I, 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 about the work in that I agree that it seems like there's passage of time and there's uh, everything David said and, and you know, this, this um, kind of con contemplative look to them but when I do it, it's really, the, the spraying's fast and it's over. And like I said, it's, um, you know, so people might see them and go, wow, like, this is like so intricate and <laughs> delicate. And, you know, I'm just really like taking a huge risk and with the, and spraying paint on, which isn't slow at all. So that, it's a funny, thing with time. Um, I, I like, I think I'm a obsessive compulsive wannabe or something, but I'm not. So it's too it fast. Mm -hmm. I hope <laughs> it was helpful. Um, if there's any last question, maybe we have time for one more. Um, if there's yes. anything pressing. Otherwise, uh, we would like to let you all know that you, of course, can email us too. If there's a question that comes to mind later on, we're happy to um, pass them on to Marcy and further conversation. Um, it's very important to us to keep a engagement as long as we're still virtual in so many aspects of our lives, we still want to have some true engagement. And this conversation certainly was um, a wonderful part of, of that ambition we, we have. I had, I had one question. Sharing. Yes, had, go ahead. I had a question. I don't know if there's time, but if there is. Yes, um, there are more. So, um, Marcy, I'm just wondering if you feel there's any kind of um, vernacular or, or vocabulary to some of the shapes um, that kind of return and morph, or whether they're, they, they recreate themselves in different relationships to everything each time. I think there is, you know, in fact, I, huh, I saw a show, I, I, I can't remember the artist, I, I loved the show. Um, and it had layers a lot like, you know, a little bit well, like mine. And they were very geometric and straight, uh, kind of rectangular forms. And so just for the heck of it, I tried to make a rectangular form. And I can't. You know, I mean, it looks so stupid. I, I ended up curving around and, you know, there's something that I do that's very natural. And I, I do think it comes from the figure. And um, I, I think that, you know, in some ways I'm, you know, I think abstract painters are either sort of taking from landscape or from the figure. And mine, I, th I think, comes from the figure more. Um, 
So I, I think you could probably find similar forms throughout all my work. Again, not intentional, but uh, they're what happen. That's what my arm does. Well, thank you, Marcy. Thank you for sharing with us so openly. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> so well spoken. <laughs> thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Amanda, for putting the slides together. They looked beautiful. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Yes. Have a wonderful <laughs> afternoon, evening, or <laughs> late morning. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to celebrate now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Marcy, from your old friend. Oh, no, it's not. Okay. Bye, bye. Bye, Thank Marcy. You. We're not sure. Okay. It's not muted. It's good.